everybody, welcome to another edition of Mr. Mom's World Speaks, uh, where we are home to friends, family, fun, for four-legged, two-legged, and of course, food, Mr. Mom's World Catering and Events. Today, I have a guest that I have known uh, for what seems like a billion years. We met when, oh, she was two and I was three. I don't know if those are the right ages, but but clearly we're still in our 30s. Um, she is a uh, an entertainer, uh, such a well-rounded entertainer, uh, completely rounded. Um, her name is Kalita Haberlin. So welcome, Kalita. Thank you for joining me on my show today. I am so excited to have you here. We have been, um, well, I've considered friends for years, but I've been a stalker of you for many years. So welcome. Well, thanks, Russell. It's awesome to be here. And congratulations on your show. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, listen, we've got lots to talk about because as I said, I knew you, I knew you and followed you and I, I guess stalked you uh, in a different time, in a, in a, in a time where we met kind of in a wilder uh, world, right? Uh, yeah. I remember you for the pink hair. That was your tour. Uh, tell me what it was like as Kalita Haverland in, in, in the time that we met. Wow. Well, that was amazing. Right. So we had, I think we had bigger hair and maybe you had more hair. I don't know. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> you have a nice head of hair, I must say. Well, uh, back here it's a little shiny. <laughs> oh, we won't look back there. <laughs> those, those years were, I call them my country days and right. days spelled, spelled D-A-Z-E. <laughs> right. Um, there was lots of uh, partying, lots of drinking, and and dare I say, imbibing in drugs of all kinds. And then, there was, and, and then there was country music. Right. And yeah, I was in the thick of it in the mid eighties. Um, would you yeah. consider? Would you like? I know you use the word country, but but I kind of referred to that that genre if you will more country rock because you you had a, a rock sound to you yeah I was I kind of did what I wanted to do sure. and if there were songs that I liked that weren't in the country vein then I would do them I was doing um I was doing Dire Straits I was doing Tina Turner what's love got to do with it uh I was doing Pat Benatar hit me with your best shot yeah, yeah. I mean like you said in your intro um you know an entertainer and I, I love to do that, whether it was at a festival, you know, in front of hundreds, thousands of people, or whether it was in a small, intimate setting where the house was just rocking and, you know, you were hired by those club owners to sell booze. Right, exactly. Yeah. So the the more energy you had, the 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 more people sweat and danced on the dance floor. Then the owners were so happy because you sold more more booze. Now in the day, what I remember the the I guess it was uh, uh, well played, most played uh, of your music at the time was a record or a single called "Too Hot to Handle." And yeah. I remember the song. I have, I think I have a copy of the LP at, at some, uh, the little miniature one. Yeah, and sure. I certainly got the, the paper, um, uh, the, the, the local paper interview photo with the pink hair and all black, black oh, yeah. uh, tight outfit. Yeah. Was that your biggest, biggest or most celebrated uh, song? Uh, well, after Too Hot to Handle, when I settled down and, uh, yeah, and was remarried. Uh, I had a song out called The Strong One. I remember that, yes. And the Strong One was a very popular song, and I actually sold lots of albums because of that song. And it was when videos were starting, so I had a video on CMT, and it was, um, yeah, it's probably my biggest song to date, but, you know, that was many years later. So during those 80s and that sort of initial part of my country music career, 
definitely, I think Too Hot to Handle was probably the song. They got a lot of radio play, a lot yeah. of radio play. I remember yeah. like, you know, it, it almost being every hour listening to CKJY and Red Deer at the time. Um, uh, I remember and then going, oh my God, that's so great. You know, you know someone that's successful. And, and of course we hung around, um, you know, the Jan Ardens and the Michelle yeah. Wrights and right. all Katie those Lang. people. Katie, Katie Lang, Lang, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's a good old Alberta girl. Right, and we also, uh, we, we talked about this prior, um, we, we, we both <laughs> had good feelings with Dr. Hook. Uh, we, we worked with him for a brief, uh, brief, brief time. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, what's it like to know all those people that are iconic, really, uh, Canadian entertainers and, and who have worked with them? Well, it, it, it's been a great career, you know. Right? Um, it's been, it was, exci it's exciting because, you know, Jan Arden was just starting out. She was playing, yep. I remember, on, I think on 17th Avenue in some little coffee house club. And um, I would fly from Ontario because that's where I was living. And I would fly in uh, to begin a tour in Alberta and go and see Jan because she used a couple of members uh, that were also in my band. Right. And so that's how I first met Jan. And, you know, everybody loved Jan. She was funny, you know, and so talented way back then. And then KD. She and I did a TV show, and I think this might have been her first TV show, and it was based out of Edmonton, yeah. uh, host, hosted by Ian Tyson, and it was That's right. Sun Country. You're right? Yeah, with Dick Caldwell. He was the host. <laughs> he and Ian. Yeah. And Katie, Katie Lang came on this show. So they taped a few shows during the day, and I was on one show, and she was on another. And so everybody was really... <clears throat> really impressed with this young singer who had the wacky hair and the sawed off cowboy boots. And so that's when I first met Kay Catherine, Catherine right. Dawn, her real name. And then we used to bump into each other when we were playing the Longhorn or playing um, the Ranchman's in Calgary. And we'd be staying at the same hotel, the Majestic Inn on McLeod Trail. And, and then I saw her, you know, later as she became more popular. But I also, Shania Twain sang backups for me on an album on, on Too Hot to Handle. She is actually one of the backup singers on that song. Crazy. She was 19. I think she was 19 or 20. And we were down in Nashville and Cyril Rawson, who I wrote the song with, um, we had decided that we were going to record it. And um, this publisher, Mary Bailey, um, she was the one that said, well, come into the studio. I'll publish the song. So uh, you come and sing it and we'll pay for it and then we'll get it out there. So she paid for the recording. But at the same time, she had this young singer uh, from Timmins and Mary was from Timmins. So she had this young singer with her, Eileen Twain. And she said, this girl's just new and she's but she's got a really powerful voice and she's, you know, wanting yeah. to do something and, and was on the spring break when she was down there in Nashville. And um, so she, she said, would you mind if Eileen sang backups on this song? And I was like, well, you're paying for it. So yep. you know, how can I say no? So yeah, so uh, Shania, as we know her today, is singing backups on that song. I have, a picture of us on my, I have a picture of us on my website of she and I in the studio with our headphones on. And, right. Yeah. So I mean, what, yeah, you know. and Michelle, Wright, Michelle Wright, that's another one. Sorry. No, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. And Michelle Wright, that's another one. You know, yeah. Michelle. And, and, and Terry Clark right. was part of that, not a part of our group. Uh, Terry Clark came came a bit after, but again, another Albertan, right? Oh, yeah, another Albertan, of course. Yeah, yeah. Terry Clark came after, as, 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 as did Paul Brandt. Yes, Paul and Brandt. I, re I, I remember being one of the judges for a, a uh, it was the Country Music Association. You know, we always have a conference and a convention, yeah. whatever you want to call it. And, and he was in a songwriting contest and I was one of the adjudicators. And I remember he came in second. <laughs> wow. Crazy. Um, so, so, you know, I'm glad you brought up Shania Twain because, you know, uh, Shania Twain is, is, you know, I guess very well known for her struggles and, and in the beginning years, uh, you know, her family loss and, and all those, but your, your life mm -hmm. somewhat mirrored 
hers in in, yeah. in a sense. Uh, yeah. So so tell us a little bit about that piece of your life. Okay, well, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Okay. Um, so farming family from Alberta. Yep, uh, Claire's uh, home. Yep, Claire's home, Carmen Gay area. And my father, oh, he suffered from depression yep. and uh, used alcohol and was in and out of the psychiatric ward, Foothills Hospital in Calgary. And um, he committed suicide when I was just 11 on our farm. And then shortly after that, my mom found out she had terminal breast cancer and she passed away a few years later of cancer. And you were about what age? Uh, I was 15. Right. Yeah. Very young. But in, be but in between there, she married someone who became my stepfather and um, he was not a very nice man. So there was lots of uh, lots of verbal and mental abuse and so my sister who was three years younger than me we were we were the ones that were still living at home I had three older brothers but they were old enough to be out on their own now so anyways within this nucleus of a family there was uh, drug addiction and alcoholism and babies given up for adoption and multiple abortions and cocaine addiction and prostitution and you know just a lot going on with all of these different tentacles of these families that had come together because right. then my stepfather m married, married someone. So it was pretty messy. And I can say that my sister and I pretty much had to parent ourselves. Right. And then two years after my mom died in the midst of all these families coming together, my oldest brother who had actually been uh, a country music DJ in Red Deer at the country station there. Yeah. His name his name was Jim Shearer. And he died of an accidental heroin overdose. So I was 17 when that happened. Right. And then and then when I was 18, um, I just wanted to get it out of under my stepfather and just the, all the dysfunction and the messiness of that family. So that's when I that's when I left for Toronto and uh, stayed in Toronto almost 35 years. Right. So, and I'm also a, a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. My, my brother, Jimmy, um, he abused several of us sexually. And um, if, yeah, if he was alive today, he would be labeled a sexual deviant. He, um, he, he was a very troubled young man. Right. Probably, pro probably be a, a large do part due to your family history as well. Right. I mean, there's, there's just, um, it's yeah. unfortunate. And so, the three, so, sorry. No, I was just going to say, so you moved to Toronto and um, yeah. when did you meet your first husband? In, in, was I, it around I, that time or? Yeah, yeah. I was 18. I met him the December of my 18th year. And then I turned 19 in January. So right. I met him. And we got together and got married when I was 21. And he right. became my manager in the mm -hmm. country music mm -hmm. business. And, and so remember him. I do, I do remember him. And, um, you know, the, 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 I, th I think, we're, you know, we go through life and I don't know if you have the same kind of philosophy that I do, but I believe that, that there's a purpose to what we have to go through. And I think that, that at times there is, um, you know, we become stronger for what we've lived through. And I think that, you know, now knowing you and knowing, uh, you know, uh, again, continuing to stalk you in your life, I believe that that yeah, you've come through on this side and yeah. a much stronger and and certainly um, uh, more beautiful inside and 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 uh, clearly beautiful onside still outside. Um, but I think that that you now have a message that's really important um, mm -hmm. as we as we move forward uh, to kind of share with the world. Do you miss the? I know you appeared on many, many shows, uh, Tommy Hunter and, and all those, how should we say, uh, older shows? Don't know if that's the word we want to use, you and I. Yeah, uh, we, are now. we are older now as we get older. They're older. Right. And so so besides Tommy Hunter, who else did you who else did you appear on or where else did you appear? You had your own show, too, did you not? One. No, I, I never had my own show. No, mm. uh, I, I always wanted my own show, but. You know, it takes a lot to do your own show. I was sure. on Rita, Rita and Friends. I was on the Bob McLean show that was out of Toronto. I was on um, the Don Heron show. 
uh, I was on Sun Country. There, there were other smaller programs that were on, um, you know, CBC TV. I did a special for CBC, and this is interesting because it was at the very beginning of my career. It was held right. at U. It was held at U of C, mm-hmm. University of Calgary Theater, and it was a real variety. Ian Tyson hosted it. Mark Knopfler was playing with the McGarrigal sisters, Doug and the Slugs, and the comedian was Jim Carrey. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I remember hanging out with him backstage, and, and I was kind of the new, I was the new country singer on the block. So that was a cool show. And then I did tons of TV down in Nashville uh, when the Nashville Network, do you remember that station? I do remember it, yeah. Yeah, so I did, I did several shows down in, in Nashville as well. And, and over in Europe too, I, right. I did some stuff in England and, and then in later in my career, I, I did lots over in Scotland as well. Right. So you have, um, you know, listen, what was, I know that you were this close. Uh, and in fact, I might be wrong, but I, I, I believe I have the story, right. You were this close to signing a record deal. Yeah. What did that yeah. look like? Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Because because what I wanted, I guess what I want people to know is this this kind of stuff in the industry happens all the time, right? Yeah. You're this close and then all of a sudden. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I was getting recognized here in Canada on the radio, TV, live shows. You know, things were going very well. And then we were uh, courting Capitol Records in Nashville. Yeah. And um I was just about ready to to sign a deal with them, but the president of Capitol Records was fired. Right. And so a lot of times when, you know, the executive of a record company are fired, then any deals that they've been working on, they're they're null and void. They're gone. So my deal, you know, is gone. It was this close as this, as the vice president phoning me and saying, we're so happy, Kalita, that we're going to be able to work with you and get your music out there and, and, you know, get the recognition that you deserve. And within a few weeks of, you know, that president being fired, you know, I, I, that was it. There was, there was nothing left for me. So I did go and actually showcase again for the new president and for all of the record labels once again, and to be honest with you, I was so ahead of my time. I was before Shania. Uh, Michelle Wright was a few years behind me. And because of my progressive nature and the way I dressed and, and the pink hair and, and all of that, uh, people didn't know what to do with me. And they didn't know where to fit me in in the country music realm. Yeah, you needed a mutt lane. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, I, and I listening to that, I, I fully understand that in the yeah. sense that I think uh, Shania was similar ahead of her time. But what really yeah. saved her, if that be the word I want to use, is the fact that she had an established husband in Mutt Lang yeah. and he was established yeah, in she, the music industry. He could push that. Right. Um, not to yeah. say that she's not talented. That's yeah. not even remotely what I'm saying, because I think she's a, a phenomenal performer. Yeah. But I, I equally find found uh, you uh, a, a phenomenal performer. So. Um, so so your world comes crashing down, for lack of a better word. Right. It, it's one of those those disappointments again, like, oh, we were this close. Um, how do you pick up the pieces mm-hmm. from that? Well. It was, it was, you know, they say things come in threes. So it, it was a huge turning point in my life. The first thing that happened was that um, I, I was in an automobile accident that just about took my life and, right. and, um, and came out of that accident uh, unscathed, totaled a vehicle, ended up at the bottom of the ditch and yet walked away. It was, in my estimation, a miracle. Right. And the second thing that happened was that I, within a few days of that accident, I finally had the the strength and the courage to leave my um, abusive marriage of 10 years, which meant I also was letting go of my business relationship with him. 
And then the third thing, it was actually three weeks after that accident that the record deal fell through. So it was a huge, it was a huge change, a huge time of transformation and, and, but for me, it was necessary because of everything that had gone in, uh, on in my life up until that point, all the personal loss and the tragedies of losing my parents and, and the, and the abuse. And there were, there was lots of abuse, lots of different kinds of abuse up right. until that point in my life. And so when I basically hit the ditch, literally, and my life blew up and my marriage ended and the, and the career came to a halt. Um, it was, it was the beginning of a new place for me, a beginning of going back to um, my belief in higher power that exists, whether we call that God, the creator. Yeah. Lord. Yep. Um, that was a huge turning point for me. And it was the first time in my life after wearing many, many different masks and, and, and living a life uh, filled with guilt and shame um, and humiliation when people die in your family because of suicide, when there's drug addiction, when there's messiness, you know, there's a lot of shame that goes along with that. So when I came out of the ditch that night and a few days later, um, I started to uh, find a freedom that I didn't have before. And I, I started to look at myself in the mirror and tell myself that there was no, no more lying, no more hiding, no more cheating, no more pretending anymore, that this was going to be me moving forward. And that was the beginning, I suppose, of, of my true healing journey. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Again, I can't imagine. So when you, you said that your career had stopped, um, yeah, I mean, didn't come to music? yeah, I mean, I was, I, I was still, you know, I was still here in Canada, but as far as having, um, uh, an American record deal right. and, you know, and, and Capitol Records still have a relationship with me here in Canada, but every artist knows that when you have the U S behind you, then the Canadian office just jumps on board. They have no right. choice. They're part of the package. Right. So for me, I didn't have the confidence of them quite so much anymore. Um, and, you know, and, and Canadian record companies at that time, and for many years, they had very limited roster and they were only had enough budget to sign a few artists a year. Sure. So, so I, I continued, but I, you know, my whole personal life was a mess and a shambles. So I kind of had to take a bit of a, a break. But that's actually when I started writing, um, you know, some of the newer types of songs that uh, that I was, you know. That well, I remember having a conver conversation with Michelle one time and um, and she had said that sometimes Canadian artists had to go abroad to become successful to be accepted here in Canada. And I thought that was so sad, right? Yeah, but that's very true. It, it, it you know, it's not so much like that anymore. I mean, right. it is and it is, you know, right. Canada is just, Canada is a smaller country. We're, yeah. we're vast in our, in our land, in our space, but our population is small right. in comparison. You know, so you have to go where the people are, where you've got lots of sales in these small pockets that are um, that, that that have a large population. You know, like in the States, you can go from one city to another in a couple of hours. Right. Here, you got to travel you know, forever. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and so um, you're now, what, 28 to 30? And um, yeah, I'm, I'm 30. I'm early 30s now. Right. Yeah. And so, so you take a couple years off and you write. Um, yeah. Are you still performing? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm still performing. Um, I'm I'm still performing, but I also got remarried. Right. Yeah. So oh, in that time, had, that's cool. And then I had a child. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, by the time I okay, so yeah, by the time I think I separated when I was around thirty-two, I got or 31 maybe and then I got married a couple of years later and then I had um my, my kid my only right. kid <laughs> your only kid yeah. do you do you go when you when you 
do you, do you in your mind say, I'm going to let the dream die? Like what, what happens in that situation? Or do you say, okay, now I got a shift. What, what goes on for you? Because, because you had a dream. There's no question about that. Yeah. I had a big dream for sure. a long, long time. And I, I continued uh, even when I uh, was pregnant and had my first child, that's when Capitol Records, I was still dealing with them. Uh, they put me together with Susan Aglukark Yeah. Because they, they thought I would be an asset to her because English wasn't her first language. And so they suggested that I write with her. And so, you know what? I mean, here I am with Capitol Records wanting them to sign me, but they signed her instead. They Crazy. signed Susan Aglukark. Now you but I mean, wrote... What I, you co-wrote a song with her that was quite big for her, did you not? Yeah, I co-wrote two songs which are on her most popular best-selling album called This Child, which went, I think it might even be, well, I have something on my wall that's uh, triple platinum. So I think, the yeah, the album probably went triple platinum in Canada. Nice. Which is, which is amazing in Canada. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so so that was good. I was still writing and getting some recognition and I was working to, and I was working on getting the next album and no matter how hard I tried every time I tried to get a producer that was going to work on it with me, you know, get the funds together, whatever it, it, it was very frustrating until finally Susan's manager, uh, Val Hawes, um, started managing me and we were able to get a uh, independent record deal through um, Peg Music, which was out of uh, Winnipeg. Oh, awesome. And so, so uh, did, is that when you switched kind of genres of music at that time? Yeah, that's when I was, I was coming to a place of, Peace. Yeah, where am I going to go? Music, yeah, peace inside and musically, it's like, mm -hmm. where am I going? I just uh, the, because I think I'd held so much in for so long, you know, the songs that I was writing and performing when I was when you knew me, you know, they were very um, they, they weren't very personal. It wasn't until I hit the ditch that you know I started really being able to express myself openly and honestly. There were a couple songs that I'd written. Uh, before that and I was recognizing that this is the true artist in me this is who I need to be to express myself but when you live uh, you know in a life filled with fear and doubt and insecurity you don't trust that and right. so I, I was still hiding myself but as I started to get real and then start writing songs that were very uh, linked to my 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 personal life then that's when I realized that this is the direction that I have to go in and because of my newfound faith and belief in God then you know my music was starting to reflect that I was I was like coming out from under this huge oppression and feeling like um, I could be myself and that I was you know I was going to be okay yeah. so that's when you know I I look back at Shania and I look at all of her success and all the kind of music that she was writing. And it wasn't until she hit that, hit her own ditch, you know, when she discovered that her husband was having an affair with her personal assistant. And then she started coming out and then she started acknowledging her parents and, yeah. and the loss that she had when she lost them in a car accident and all that stuff that took place. And I, cause I used to think, I used to think Shania, come on. Where are you, girl? I know there's another person in there, but she always had this face, and I still sure. could relate to that. And I knew that eventually she would. Anyways, that's an yeah. aside. Yeah. But, but uh, yes. So the the next album that I finally came out with was called "The Strong One," and right. that was kind of like my coming out of you know letting people know that I've found the faith that I would, yeah, and that I survived, and yeah, and that I had experienced childhood sexual abuse and there's a song on there called unusual child which really resonated with so many um and that was like you know that was in 1996 so once again Long here's time. Kalita time i'm talking about stuff that people weren't talking about that then Not yeah absolutely the um 
I know you to be a funny person. Uh, although <laughs> in the day, I did not know you to have characters. So when well, did I did. I actually started doing characters in in country. See, well, I did. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, because I guess when I was touring with you and uh, Doctor Hook, I yeah. yeah, because the two two of us were on the same bill, there wasn't really time for me to do my comedy. Sure. But uh, I started doing comedy when I was a kid. I started creating these characters, and and then when I went to university. See, when I went to Toronto, I, I went to university for four years and I studied theater. I studied acting. And so I continued to create these crazy characters. Crazy is the word. Women. Lovable. And yeah, lovable. Yeah. And so when I started doing country music, um, yeah, I would do them in the clubs. There was Dixie Lee and she's my country and Western singer. Right. And then there's Sophia Flanagan and she's my trailer. Partner. Love her. Yeah. And so I, I used to do those. In fact, I used to go into the clubs and I would dress up in full costume with the big boobs and the hair and yeah. the cowboy boots and the rhinestones on my cowboy boots while they were sequins. And I would go and sit up at the bar and start talking to some of the men like in character. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, I'd be on the stage in this outfit singing and doing this comedy and I used to I used to fool people all the time and I used to do these characters I did Dixie Lee probably just Dixie Lee when I did some overseas tours for sure. the Canadian Armed Forces yeah and the one tour I did we actually put Dixie Lee's picture on the poster as well as mine so when the when the show's all over and we're socializing with the soldiers, some of them are, they're asking, well, where's, where is she? Where's right. the singer that, you know, where's the, there's supposed to be another woman here. And then I would, you know, tell them, well, it's me. She, she's somewhere <laughs> in here for sure. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're, we're out of time, but if I was to ask okay. you this, um, yeah. you know, one of my things, as you know, I have a bazillion children and, um, you know, I always like to kind of feel out people now being an old timer myself. I would like to, you know, what words of wisdom would you give to people uh, starting out in the music industry? Because we, we, you know, we live in a world where, hey, let's become YouTube famous. Hey, let's become TikTok famous. Hey, let's become all those things. And yeah, it happens to kids. But but what what words of a wisdom would you pass on to to the generation now trying to become or live to their dream potential? Right. Well, first of all, what I would say, and people used to tell me this all the time, is find your own style, your own sound. You know, when we're young, we like to sound like our favorite artists. Sure. And that's okay. But we have to develop our own style, our own sound, because there's already one Drake. There's already one Rick Rihanna. There's already one Taylor Swift. And we don't need another one. We need another you, another unique, you know, who you are. And and by sometimes you need to put all of the influences aside and and not listen to so much anymore and just right. try to listen to yourself. And whether you're a writer or um, maybe you're just a singer, but it's, it's to not try to emulate the other artists. I would say that's important. The other thing is, is that if you play the guitar, if you play the piano, if you play an instrument, if you write songs, then what you need to do is, is work at that, as work at that mm -hmm. craft, become, become the best you can be at, at performing, at executing. You know, we re rely a lot on machines to do things for us and we can sure. rely on machine music too, but to learn how to sing in pitch, to play your instrument, to practice, to become the best that you can be, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't happen overnight. And you, you know, the, the people that are really, really good at what they do have worked really hard at it. So it takes right. hard work. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. And then I would say the third thing is that just to keep believing, even when others might not believe in you. you right. Just have to keep, yeah. Just have to keep going. Keep going. 
when the going gets tough, you need to just pick yourself up and dust yourself off because I can't tell you how many times you'll get rejected and you have to grow that thick skin and get used to that. It's just part of the business that you can't take it personally because not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to like the way you sing or the way you write or the way you perform, but there will be an audience that you'll find who will love what you do. And you'll never, and and just to add to that, uh, you'll never ever be everything to everybody. And if you stop believing in yourself, you've Uh, lost the game. Yeah. Gotta believe in yourself for sure. Exactly. My many, many, many thanks. You know, I love you a ton. Um, I continue to follow you and um, you know, I wish you nothing but much, much success, which is overly due for you. Um, I know you've had success. That's not what I mean. I just, I I think that, that um, you bring to the world, uh, an ability to make other people be better people. And, and I want to thank you because I think you're amazing. And um, I hope we get together soon. Thank you, Russell. Thanks. It's been great chatting with you. You've asked great questions. Oh, <laughs> good. <laughs> thank you so much. I will, I will see you on another show, hopefully. I hope so. Thanks, Russell. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.